Hi there folks, Martin Lane here from Orange Technology and in this video I actually want to talk about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. So this is the hot uh, the hot thing, the hot trend right now um, in the IT space is all the cybersecurity stuff. And I really want to talk about you know what cybersecurity is, what you should be looking at, and then I want to talk about you know the job prospects that are actually in the real world. Because uh, I think there's a little bit of confusion about this. So cybersecurity, for, for me and the way I look at it, cybersecurity is two primary parts, okay? There's an internal part and an external part. The internal part um, has actually very little to do with, with cyber, with, with internet and, and, and the way you would think about cybersecurity. And it actually has a lot to do with human resources, um, you know, physical things, all that kind of stuff. So for example, in a previous video I talked about um, uh, if, if an organization requires a passphrase. So passphrases are generally more secure than passwords. Passphrases are generally longer, they have more complex requirements. The problem with that is what happens if somebody writes it down on a post-it note and puts it on their monitor because they can't remember it because it's too long. Right? That's a problem. And, and honestly, that is a huge cybersecurity problem. Now, I know what you're thinking, well, that's more of a physical problem. Somebody shouldn't write their password on a post-it, but really, I mean, it. It is a security problem for your digital systems. Therefore, it is a cybersecurity problem and it is something you need to think about. You know, another thing you, you need to look at is, um, is, is physical security. If you have servers, if you have data, are those locked up? Are they in a locked room? Can any employer, any visitor into a business or, or an organization or an office access these things if they just walked off? Hey, is, you guys have a bathroom? Yeah, it's just down the hall, okay. And literally on the way to the bathroom, they have to pass the, the server rack or, or, or the table or, or the closet where all of the, the data is stored, right? I mean, that's a huge cybersecurity risk. Again, it's not a risk from the cyber world, but it is, it, it, it is, it is a risk to your cyber data, right? And that's something you need to think about. So, I mean, I'll just talk quickly on, on the past phrase, right? And, and certain things that you should be thinking about. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of organizations are going to these past phrases. They're, they're more secure than past words is the theory and the thought. The problem with past phrases is generally they're, they're quite long, right? Like, uh, my dog is Lucy uh, who barks, right? There's capitals in there. There's an exclamation mark at the end. There's some special character in there. You know, my dog has an apostrophe in it, uh, D-O-G apostrophe S et cetera, et cetera. Now the trouble with, with that is, you know what? A lot of people aren't going to remember it. So, you know, they may write it on a post and put it on their monitor. That's probably the worst thing they could do, uh, or they'll do something else. And, you know, is that really that secure? What's more likely to happen is that, um, uh, that the users won't choose something complex like that. They'll choose something simple. I mean, the most common pass phrase that exists out there, and a lot of people use it. I've seen it. A lot of people use it. This is a secret. Literally, this is a secret. Yeah, it's a pass phrase. It's a sentence. Right? And, you know, I'll, I'll explain a little bit why people do this and why they use things like that. Right? And this isn't because they're trying to screw the system. This isn't because they're trying to be a pain. This isn't because they don't want to be secure. This all has to do with the subconscious up here in the brain. So what happens is, you know, there's, there's a new policy that comes out and everybody's got to have a passphrase now. It's got to be 18 characters long or, or whatever the rules are around it. And, you know, some, some people, some people have excellent memory. Some people will go, oh, that's, that's no problem. We use passphrases everywhere. And away they go and they're done. Other people, and I would argue the majority of people, are going to go, oh, I'm not going to remember that. How, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? So their subconscious starts to think about, okay, what could I create that's the easiest for me to remember, right? For example, this is a secret. It's kind of amusing, right? What's your past phrase? Well, it's a secret. Ah, oh, right? This is a secret. So subconsciously, they go, okay, I can remember that. And you know what? It fits the past phrase, so it is secure. They don't think about the fact that, you know, if they thought about that right away, would somebody else think about that right away? They don't think about that because that's not their job, right? Their, their job is, is finance, admin, or HR, or what, whatever their role is. They have a specific job, they have a specific role, and thinking about this is likely, you know, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, not part of their role. So 
you know, their their mind defaults to, hey, you know, I can remember that. That's what I'm going to use. But that becomes, I would argue, that becomes less secure because that is one of the most well-known passphrases out there that is used. I would argue it is less secure than a five-character password, right? That say requires a number. I would say that is likely more going to be more secure than you know a basic passphrase if somebody chooses that common one. So these are things you really need to think about, and 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 these are these are not cool things. These are not uh, you know this isn't what's glorified when it comes to cybersecurity, but it is one of the foundational things about cybersecurity that you need to think about, right? And without laying that foundation, you have no hope and no chance at all to get to the second part, which is the external threats. So the external threats, these are things that come off the internet. These are things from outside of your physical or organization, right? So these could be uh, everything from malicious users out there to botnets to automated attacks to state sponsored stuff i've seen all of these okay my just so you guys understand my primary role at orange technology uh, is security network security that is my role no one else does that i do it solely i am responsible for the security of the networks of all of our clients okay so i literally every day i go through firewall logs <laughs> firewall logs firewall logs more firewall logs, and I go through and I look for things, right? And this is one of those things, you know, we all heard about that Sony hack, right? And that Sony hack was not something that happened from one second to the next, right? That somebody didn't just, you know, break in and, and that was it. This was something that happened over a period of time. And what I found in the cybersecurity industry, um, in, in, in this niche within the IT or, or within within uh, the uh, technology industry, is that a lot of people get complacent, right? They buy their firewall, I've got my firewall, uh, I've got an intrusion prevention system, I'm good. They're automated, I'm good, that's it. And, and I, I would say absolutely not. Um, cybersecurity requires a human element. You have to be active and you have to be involved in your cybersecurity um, initiatives, protection, any of that kind of stuff. Particularly, and, and I'll explain this how I do this with, with most of, most of uh, the client networks that Orange Technology has. Um, when I go through these firewall logs, uh, I mean, I see all kinds of, um, you know, what, what you would consider network intrusion attempts, right? So I see, for example, an IP address from, I'll, I'll use an example from this morning. I see an IP address from China um, trying to connect to uh, the Telnet port, that's port 23, on a network that doesn't have an, any kind of Telnet services. Right, so the firewall blocks it, logs it, and I see it. Now I see these day in, day out, all the time. Any given hour, I'll see dozens of these attempts. Right, Telnet, FTP, uh, what, whatever, um, port fifty nine hundred, VNC, all, all these things. Right, and the way I would explain this um, is, if you would to use an analogy, if you have a car parked in a parking lot and you've got a thief who's going around trying to steal stuff out of cars or steal cars. And they go to every single car in that parking lot and they try the door handle, right? Most door handles are locked. If your door handle is locked, you, your car's in this parking lot, your car is locked. They try the door handle, it's locked. They move on to the next car. At some point, they're going to find a car that is unlocked. Somebody forgot or somebody doesn't lock the car and, you know, away they go stealing stuff. I'm not too worried about those, right? I mean, those are kind of one-offs. These are likely automated systems just scanning the internet. They're scanning every IP address, every known IP address and they're just looking for every network that has port 23 open. Likely what happens is they'll compile a list of every network that has port 23 open, and then that will be actioned upon later somehow, you know, either by a person or another automated system or whatever, right? I'm not worried about that. What I look for is patterns, right? So if I see an IP address, an offending IP address, they tried port 23, didn't work, okay. Two minutes later, they tried port 21, that's FTP, didn't work, okay. Two minutes later, they try port 5900, that's VNC. So if you don't know what VNC is, um, Google, it's, a, it's a, a remote access tool, essentially for remote viewing of, of a desktop and controlling it. Um, popular to use inside of networks, uh, not so popular to use re remotely anymore these days, but you know, I mean, again, it's, it's had a standard port for, for many, many years. So they try port 5900, oh, all right. Then a few minutes goes by and they try port 3389, which is um, the, the RDP port. 
for remote uh, desktop protocol from, from Microsoft, from their built-in um, client. You know, and then they try other ports. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for patterns because now, again, if we use the analogy of a car in a parking lot, this is now a thief that has gone up to your car, tried your driver's side door. Oh, it's locked. Hmm. Can I go around the other side of the car? I'll try the passenger door. Oh, it's locked. Okay. Um, I'll try the trunk. Oh, it's locked. Oh, they, they've got a sunroof. Is it closed or is it, is it open? Let's go have a look, right? I'm more worried about those guys and, and I will deal with those guys, right? I will deal with the, with those malicious offenders. I'll block them from being able to access any service, legitimate or not, on on, on the network and and so forth. There's a few things that that we do to to basically shut those people out, right? But the thing is, if you take the human element out, if you if you take out the fact that somebody is watching that, you wouldn't know, right? The automated system, your firewall, your UTM, your whatever intrusion prevention system. They'll block all those intrusion attempts, but they're just going to block them. They're, you, you know, that that offender is still going to be able to try the next port and the next port. If you have really advanced systems, it may block them out for a period of time. So if they try, you know, if, if you get five connection attempts from an IP address um, on, you know, that were not authenticated and, and on ports that, that don't have open services, you know, you can set the more advanced systems to block that offender for a specified period of time, 30 minutes or whatever. But again, if you're not watching that after 30 minutes, they can try again. These people, these these offending um, automated networks, botnets, people, state sponsor groups, whatever, they can try this for years. If you're not watching it and you don't know, they can try for years to penetrate your network. I mean, think about how often your public IP address changes. Right? I've had the same public IP address dynamically assigned. I'm not paying for a static IP. Right? I get a dynamically assigned IP address and I've had the same one for four years. Four years. Right? I mean, a, a, a lot of you people in, in more metropolitan areas, if you have business internet services for your clients, most business internet services do come with static IPs automatically. So they're just assigned a static IP. And that's it. They, they have it and that's theirs. And I mean, think about it. how often do you change that static IP? Really, you don't want your IP address to change because, I mean, you have VPN clients set up for, for remote workers, for people who leave the office. You've got, you know, services set up. Maybe you have VPN bridges to remote offices. So you've got branch offices that are, that are connecting back. You don't want your IP address to change. But if it doesn't and remains constant, then somebody can sit there, you know, again, in theory, for years. And, and, and try to compromise the system. And if there's only an automated system on the other end, you know, that let's say blocks them out for 30 minutes at a time, you know, after five wrong attempts, all that does is it increases the amount of time they need to compromise the system. And be very clear, be very clear. There is no system that exists on this planet that cannot be compromised. They can all be compromised, every single one of them. That's just a fact. Anybody that, anybody that tells you they've got the next firewall or intrusion prevention system or whatever that cannot be hacked is lying to you, selling you snake oil, and they're just not being truth, uh, truthful. They're just not. They're just lying to you to sell you something. There is no system on the planet that cannot be circumvented somehow. So given that in mind, again, there's a lot of, I, I mean, automation when it comes to security has come a long way. I will say that. From you know several years ago, there have been a lot of advances, and they've been great. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying automation is, is junk or anything, but there has to be a human element still. You need to be looking at those things. So again, like my understanding, and and, and I could be mixing up all these hacks because there's been so many high profile ones. Is the the Sony one specifically? Um, the 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 core network that was breached was actually under attack for a long time. It's just that nobody noticed because nobody looked at those, those log files and, and nobody realized that somebody was actively trying to gain access and it was just taking a long time, right? So when the breach occurred, of course, you know, oh, they got hacked, they got hacked. But what nobody really wants to talk about is the fact that the attack had been happening for a long period of time, a very long period of time, right? I mean, I, I've seen this with networks that we have taken over. Um, I will say, um, again, I, I, I don't want to promote any security practices or anything like that. I, I want to give everybody an overview um, on what you should be thinking about so you can make those choices for yourself. 
But one thing I, I will say, absolutely, um, we, we here at Orange, we do not leave RDP open to the web ever. We never leave RDP open to the web. And the reason for that is because if you do that, you are leaving a username and password field open to the entire internet to try, right? If there's some reason that RDP should be open for some kind of purpose, we will do it, but we will restrict it to certain public IP addresses that should be able to access it, right? If somebody needs access to their network because they travel a lot and they could be in airports, or they could be in different hotels, I would set up a VPN service, right? I mean, really the, the minimum anybody should be doing at this point is an SSL VPN service. You should be adding in, in this day and age, the two-factor authentication. I understand for some people that's not in the budget or whatever, but VPN service, you know, SSL, SSL VPN or an IPsec VPN should be the minimum that you're doing. It should be the absolute minimum that you're doing. Having RDP open to the web, again, in my opinion, is an absolute no, no, when it comes to security, it is a huge vulnerability. You are creating a gigantic security hole into your uh, network. Now, when we talk about, now, when I say that, uh, I have experienced clients who have had breaches with RDP open to the world. Uh, not because we opened it, but we actually gained clients because they were hacked, because they lost all their data, because the previous service provider they were using left RDP open to the world and left that vulnerability there. And, you know, there they again, they weren't watching log files. If you're going to leave it open, again, I would argue that's a bad practice. But if you're going to, you need to watch log files. Um, you know, whether that's a, a, a firewall log file that's allowing traffic through that port, um, or you're watching um, audit security audit logs. If, uh, if you've seen the security audit log field on a modern Windows server, it gets really full really quick and that's not going to be so easy to, to look through. But, you know, you need to be watching that stuff if you're going to do it. I, I would argue don't do it. Do not do it. But anyway, so, you know, we had this client, their previous IT service provider was not watching uh, security logs. They had RDP open to the web. Um, why? I'm not sure because they weren't using it to provide support. So I'm not sure why they had it open to the web. Didn't make any sense, but they did. And in that, at some point, the network got breached. Somebody got in, uh, you know, basically destroyed a server. Uh, they lost some data because on top of that, there wasn't really good uh, backup regimes going on. There, there wasn't a very good disaster recovery plan in place, all that stuff. So, you know, again, these are simple things you need to be thinking about. But again, this is one of those things where this cannot come from an automated process. This requires human manual intervention. These are things you need to think about. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the job prospects. So, so those are the two things I, I consider to be at primary aspects of cybersecurity is internal and external. And they're really two very, very different things that you need to be thinking about. Uh, one is really not all that cybery. And one certainly is. So, you know, a lot of people focus on on the one that is cybery, those external threats, hackers from from you know across the ocean. But I would argue the some of the bigger threats, um, uh, potential vulnerabilities and threats to your network are actually from that first one, those internal ones. So, you know, something about there. Now we move on to the job prospects, and I, I, I do get a lot of these questions. I get a lot of these questions from students. I get a lot of these questions from people starting out in the field is I want to be in cybersecurity. How do I get into cybersecurity? Um, and I will say there are jobs in cybersecurity. There are jobs and that field will grow. That being said, are there as many jobs as I think are being put out there, especially by these cybersecurity training and education programs? No, I, I don't believe so. I believe there are fewer. Um, you know, if we start at the very top, we look at CSOs, um, uh, Chief Security Officer, right? That's the C-level executive um, that is responsible for security of data, security of information, security of networks, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so, you know, you want to be a CSO. Well, a CSO certainly has to have um, a knowledge on computer systems, security systems, that kind of thing. They absolutely have to have knowledge in that. They have to have experience in that, et cetera, et cetera but they also have to understand business, right? One of the things you have to think about is when you're looking at a system, if you're looking at a system and it's gonna cost you, uh, say a million dollars, hypothetically, it's a million dollars for this intrusion prevention system, okay? 
and you look at this and you go, okay, you know, this is a good system. I, I have no question that that system is good or not. Should we buy it? One of the factors you have to consider is what is your exposure if your system is compromised, right? So you already have a firewall. You already have a couple things in place, right? So you have to figure out um, and part of this is, is an estimate is, you know, what is, what is my potential vulnerability as it is, right? What, what vulnerabilities will this intrusion prevention system that I'm thinking of buying for a million dollars solve, right? So there's a percentage, like it's not gonna solve all, all of your problems, it'll solve a certain specific amount of those problems, right? Or it'll address a certain, a certain amount of those vulnerabilities or whatever. You have to figure out of that, of what that system will address, how much of that, or how large is that in the grand scheme of things? So if your vulnerability is 100%, okay, and your firewalls and everything are covering 80%, right, and this intrusion prevention system is going to cover another 10%, what is that 10% worth in the overall vulnerability of 100%? And then you have to do some calculations on, you know, what what is my what is my um, my exposure. On, on the 10%, what are the chances that somebody is going to use that specific 10% to compromise the system? Then you also have to go and say, okay, let's say my system is compromised, you know, within, within the 10% that that, that that intrusion prevention system should alleviate. What's the cost on that? You know, what's the deductible in our insurance? How much will our insurance go up? What will that do to the brand? And if you factor all that in and you, and, and you lay all this out and, and, and you look at this, it's, it's actually called a BIA, a business impact assessment. If you factor all these things out and the number you come to, the financial figure you come to is less than a million dollars, generally you don't buy the system. Because if you don't buy the system, there is not a guarantee that you will be compromised through a method that that system should have prevented. There's also not a 100% guarantee that, that that system will prevent it, right? And if your, if your business impact analysis shows that your, your exposure, how, you know, how much this will cost you, will actually be less than what the system costs anyways, then generally you roll the dice, right? I mean, it's like, uh, if any of you watched Fight Club, and I'm sure most of you have, it's, it's in, in Fight Club, there's, there's a scene where uh, where uh, the Edward Norton character is on a plane and he's talking to the person in the seat next to him and he's saying, you know, you take the, uh, the amount of units we have out there, he's, he's, he's talking about cars, the amount of units that are out there on the road, the probability of failure, and then the average cost of an out-of-court settlement if, if they're sued. A times B times C equals D. If D costs it, it cost less than the cost of a recall, they don't do a recall. And that is what the business impact assessment is, right? Or sorry, the, uh, the business impact analysis, BIA, business impact analysis. That is what it does, is it, it goes and it shows you, um, you know, whether it is worth purchasing the solution or not, based on what the impact would be to your business if something occurred. And the reason I say that is because that is something you learn in business school, right? Um, not that I'm advocating an MBA or anything like that, but that is something you don't learn in cybersecurity specifically. Cybersecurity specifically, you learn about firewalls and intrusion prevention and anti-malware and things like that, but they don't teach you the business side of things. Because again, if, if, if the cost of the system is more than what you could potentially lose if something happened, you generally don't buy the system. And again, that's part of your business impact analysis. And that is a business uh, skill. So, you know, again, the CSO absolutely has to have a background in, in uh, technology and things like that, but they also have to understand business. As a C-level, they're expected to understand business, right? Again, if, if, if you're further down the chain, if, if you are a manager, if you are an IT manager and you're responsible for security, likely you have staff that deal with all that, you know, sorry, not entry-level stuff, um, uh, baseline stuff, the, the firewall rules and things like that. But again, if you're a manager, you have to have HR skills, right? You have to understand the business as well. You have to have some business skills because you need to understand, you know, is this risk in, in what we're going to open up on the firewall, is that worth it based on the business and what we need to do that for? Or is that an unnecessary risk? 
Is it a necessary risk or is it a necessary risk because our business depends on this? If we don't have this going, the business will close down and quite frankly, there's nothing to worry about cybersecurity wise anyways, because there is no business running anymore. So that's, that's, you know, again, and that trickles down, you know, even if you're an entry level employee, it trickles down to that. It's, it's not just about the cybersecurity portion. It's not just about the packets and the hackers and all that. Um, so that, that's what I would argue that the real jobs are in the cybersecurity world. It's not just about cybersecurity. It's about that overall understanding. Uh, another huge aspect, quite frankly, to cybersecurity is regulatory. What's your regulatory environment look like? Um, and for example, here in Canada, we have very, very strict uh, privacy regulations where it makes it difficult to use um, some cloud services that are in the U.S. because then your data is now housed in the U.S. and is subject to different laws than we have in Canada. That really has nothing to do with cybersecurity in and of itself. This cloud cloud provider may provide excellent security, but because of the regulatory environment, putting your data into the U.S. may not be allowed, depending what the data is and, and the nature of it, right? So you have to think about those things. And, that, and, and again, the regulatory environment has nothing to do with cybersecurity the way most of us think about it. But, but really, I mean, it, it is an aspect that we do have to think about. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Are there jobs in the field? Yes, there are jobs in the field. I would not say that cybersecurity in general is total hogwash. Absolutely not. There are jobs in the field. They do exist. It is a growing field, um, especially from, especially on, on the public sector side. Uh, there is a recognition from governments. There is a, there is a recognition from public bodies that cybersecurity, uh, especially for them is lacking, needs to be, um, focused on, um, you know, there's there, there's lots of talk. Even, even, I mean, locally here, I mean, again, I'm in a territory of 38,000 people. You know, we do have a municipal government. We have a territorial government. Uh, you know, even with us, with our small uh, small population relative to, you know, larger metropolitan centers, we're thinking about it. We're looking at it going, okay, we really need to think about, you know, security. We need to think about the regulatory environment. We need to think about, you know, um, uh, something called, uh, compartmentalization. So if I have this much data that's sensitive and I have 30 people working on it, do all 30 of those people need to see the entirety of the data or do each of those people only need to see a small portion? You know, we see this in, in, in the medical field and, and I've talked about this in other, in my, uh, uh, my regulatory video, um, uh, where I talked about, um, the regulatory environment and thinking about that is you, you have a doctor who puts notes onto a patient file. In, in some kind of electronic fashion, an EMR, an electronic medical record, it's called. They put notes in there um, and then, you know, save it and whatever, good. Uh, then does the medical office assistant, the MOA, who does all the scheduling and orders tests and things, do they need to see those notes? Do they need to see the notes of the appointments or, or, or do they just need to see, yes, this is a patient, yes, this is their doctor, okay, you know, I'm gonna print this form and it goes to uh, this particular physician, right? Do they need to see the notes? Do, do they need to see what the doctor thought of, you know, X, X, Y, or Z, or whatever the patient was in there for? And that's kind of the, that, that's what we're talking about when, when, when we reference the term uh, compartmentalization of information is, you know, it's, it's basically a, a, a need uh, to know, right? Do you need to know this? Does the MOA need to know the, the patient notes of the doctor's visit in order to serve everything they need to serve the patient with, which, you know, is scheduling, um, um, scheduling appointments, scheduling tests, printing off forms, that kind of thing. Do they need to know what the physician wrote specifically in the notes in order to be able to schedule a follow-up appointment? And the argument is no, they don't. So why do they have to see the notes or why do they have access to those notes? Right. And that's, that, that's something that's, that's really going on. I mean, especially locally for us, that's something we're looking at, um, in, in, in all of the public bodies, not, not us specifically orange technology, but, uh, the government and, and, and the public bodies and, and the security officials that, that work for these public bodies are looking at this and, and, and they're looking at, you know, are, are more people seeing data that they don't need to see? And then how do we deal with that? How do we rectify that and that kind of thing? So, so again, absolutely. Yes, there are jobs in the field. 
Uh, again, it, it may not be what you're thinking of. Again, I, I, I mentioned that cybersecurity is, is not just external. It's not just about the hackers and the botnets and all that. Uh, it, it is also about the internal, internal practices, you know, HR practices, all that kind of thing that are things you have to think about and look at as a cybersecurity professional. So, so again, you know, the main things from this video is, you know, really look at what cybersecurity really is as opposed to what it's being sold by, by a lot of these training and educational groups uh, who want you to think it's all about hackers and all about that. It's not. Um, and then also, yes, there are jobs in the field. If anyone tells you there are no jobs in the field, I would argue that's not actually true. Um, if, anyone, if anyone tells you there are a huge abundance of jobs in this field and we don't have enough people, I would argue that's probably also not true. It, it is a growing field and, and there will be more of a need for these professionals. Um, you know, and there are jobs out there right now, but I wouldn't say that, you know, there, there's some gigantic shortage that just can't be filled at the moment. So, so yeah, again, if it's your passion, by all means, I, 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 I would say go for it. Um, you know, understanding that it's not just about hackers and, and botnets and malware. Um, but absolutely, yes, I, I, I would go for it. I, I would say that, that it, is, it is a good field. Um, and yeah, other than that, I will see you guys at the next video.